On the surface, it might seem like not much has changed at my little wildlife pond. But luckily for us, that couldn't be further from the truth. This is what the pond looked like where we last left off. The plastic felt uninviting, the grass was a lot shorter, and overall, I'll admit, it looked a little bit barren. So to change that, the first thing I wanted to do was to add some plants into the pond. These would only be temporary until I can decide on some more long-term residents. I chose willow as they're a water-loving species that can quickly establish their roots. All I had to do was cut a few branches off an existing tree and stick the cuttings into the pond. The willow roots will quickly sprout and the bigger they get, the better they'll be at filtering water, which ultimately helps provide fresher and fresher water to the birds and wildlife. I'm hoping that the addition of the trees will give some habitat to the aquatic life in the pond, like the diving beetles, pond skimmers, and the very rare and very elusive black wolf. The next thing on the list was to address the plastic along the edges. I added sand to cover as much of it as I could, and I realized that this required a lot more sand than I first thought. I'll be adding even more sand when I eventually dig out the spot for my blind in future episodes. To add some temporary greenery to the edges, I decided to add two plants that don't really need much water, chives and stone crops. I wanted species that were easy to grow and that can quickly establish a root system within the soil. Grasses and other species will grow in the open spaces between these plants. But it's nice to have some extra greenery around the pond, especially with the pops of pink from the chive flowers, which also attracts a number of different native bees and insects. I even bought a cheap $20 solar fountain to give the pond a little bit more life. Solar fountain for the pond. Let's see if it actually works. I hear it going. It says it's supposed to start working in... Oh yeah, in three seconds. Oh, it floats. Having a drip, trickle, or fountain at the water source is a great way to attract more birds and wildlife. They often associate the sound of flowing water with clean water. So adding some movement to the pond, in addition to the reflectiveness of the water from above, it quickly became a water feature that was hard to miss. After these additions, I wouldn't be able to check on the pond for two whole weeks. So I added a trail camera overlooking the bank, and I couldn't believe the activity at the pond when I returned. I haven't been able to check out the pond for the past two weeks, so the first order of business is to check what's on that trail camera. I'm pretty excited. You never know what's really going to pop up, and that's the joy of trail cameras, is that you can have kind of like eyes and ears in the field 24-7, as long as you have it out there and that the batteries last and that it's actually triggering properly, which is a whole other thing. But let's go in here and check. Moment of truth. Oh my gosh, it says that there's 1,492 videos on this memory card. What the heck? This is either a bunch of false triggers or we just had a lot of activity at the pond. 1,400, oh my gosh, what's the math on that? 20 seconds long each? Let me go on the calculator here. Yeah, that's almost 500 minutes of footage to look through. Oh crap. My original plan was to go through the videos with you in the field, but as I started scrolling through them, it quickly became apparent that many of the videos weren't false triggers. We just had a lot of activity at the pond. The trail camera managed to record over 20 different bird and mammal species. For the mammals, eastern chipmunks, red squirrels, and striped skunks were all recorded multiple times on the camera. When it came to the bird species, I think the results perfectly displayed how powerful water is as an attractant. We got five different species of sparrow,
four different species of blackbird. Huge families of European starlings. And some of the most colorful and beautiful birds this area has to offer. When Eastern Kingbirds came for a drink, they quickly dived down to grab a sip, which I tried to capture on a few occasions with no success. The Northern Flicker would come drinking and probing for insects in the sand, and a few weeks earlier, while doing some work nearby, I also filmed a tree swallow on the bank, photographed the barn swallow looking for mud for its nest, and a brief visit from a warbling vireo after taking a bath. But the species that showed up the most, with over 400 videos recorded, and probably my favorite bird to watch on the trail camera has been the American crow. At first, I only saw a few videos of the adult crows, but they were quickly followed by hundreds of videos of five juvenile crows. These recently fledged crows with their pink ape and short tails became the stars of the pond. American crows are a part of the Corvidae family, which is known to be one of the smartest groups of birds on the planet. When their parents aren't around, the young crows try to figure out what they can actually eat. Flowers, rocks, and leaves are all taste tested with disapproval. They may not be able to call themselves the smartest birds yet, but luckily they have their parents nearby to help. Even with the young crows watching their parents feeding on different foods, they still haven't quite figured out how some things work yet. One behavior that's common among crows is to soak their food before eating it. This can help clean it, but more importantly, it helps to soften the food before it's eaten. They do this with carcasses, fish, bread from who knows where, and harder foods like corn. Well, now I solve the mystery of why there was corn cobs floating around my pond for a couple weeks. I rewatched every clip on the trail camera three times to make sure I didn't miss anything, and I figured the timestamps at the bottom of each video can give me some good clues as to when the pond is the busiest. That way I can maximize my time when doing photography and filming wildlife at the pond. This graph I put together shows that the busiest period is between noon and 6 p.m., with the peak being around 3 p.m. This makes total sense considering that it's typically the hottest part of the day. After watching all the trail camera footage, I went out the next day to check on the pond during the daytime to see what was going on off camera. And then I'll spend the next two days photographing birds from my blind. The first thing I noticed was how alive everything was. Considering the plants got hammered by the terrible weather the past two weeks. It's been extremely dry and hot, with the exception of two nights where we dropped to negative degree weather, which frosted and destroyed many of the plants. You gotta love that Canadian weather. Plants that I transplanted from a nearby pond were producing seeds, but they were also a source for a bit of algae growth. Algae is often seen as a bad thing to have, but in low amounts it can actually be a benefit to the pond. Remember the clips from a few minutes ago when I showed the crows bringing in food and carcasses into the water? Well algae can help with breaking down some of the plant and animal matter in the water. I'll need to keep an eye on it, but it's really only a problem if it starts overtaking the pond. In that case I'd likely need to add more plants, shade, fish, or a combination of all three. The goal isn't to eliminate algae altogether, but rather find a balance where algae and other aquatic life can live together. I used a small pool net to sample the algae and see what was lurking beneath the waterline. A few species of diving beetle were present, as well as mosquito larvae, which again, another thing that is often seen as a negative, but these things are great food sources for aquatic insects. It really made me laugh when an hour later I saw a dragonfly laying its eggs in the water. Dragonfly larvae are voracious predators of, you guessed it, diving beetles and mosquito larvae. Nature has a way of balancing itself out. I even noticed this balance inside of my blind as a few resident spiders have helped manage the mosquito population. With everything up and running, I finally set out early the next morning to see what would show up in front of me at the pond.
going to be an extremely warm day today. It's already really hot for what it is. We're in the morning and it's about 25, 26 degrees. We're going to get up to 35. So I'm hoping that means that birds are going to come here earlier, start drinking and bathing. And it probably means that there's going to be a lot of action here. So all my cameras are set up. Everything's good to go. It seems like the data from the trail camera was right. Not many birds visit early in the morning and it took nearly three hours for the first bird to show up but I was excited to see it was one of the crows I spent so many hours watching on the trail camera. This clip also shows how having raised edges on the pond helps to divert traffic to the back. The crow tries to drink from the edge, but doesn't feel too comfortable, so he walks all the way to the back to get a sip of water. Remember that clip from a few minutes ago of the dragonfly laying its eggs in the water? It's a good thing it did because I have a very strange feeling that it won't be breeding anytime soon. In my last pond video, I mentioned how I wanted to do the update on a really hot day. And the one small thing that I didn't factor in was just how hot it would be in this blind. I'm like pouring sweat. I don't know if it shows up on the camera. I have the windows open, so there's kind of a cross breeze going through. But in addition to that, I think I'm downwind. Oh, there's a flicker calling right now. That would be cool if a flicker came. Um, I'm downwind of, I guess, a farmer who put some manure in his field. So in here, it's kind of like a sweaty sauna mixed with manure. And I should be miserable, but the fact that birds are showing up and that the pond's working really nicely, I'm, I'm really happy. Day two at the blind today. I decided to only do the evening since we have a completely different day today. Yesterday was overcast and really humid, and today it's full sun, but there's a nice cool breeze coming through. That's why I can sit in here a lot more comfortably. And one thing that's really awesome is that right now I'm just talking like this at a normal volume. I'm not trying to really be quiet. And I have probably like five or six goldfinch just eating the seed, perched and drinking right in front of me, and they don't really care. So the pond is working amazingly. Even when I just walked up to get into the blind, it's not like I was trying to be quiet or anything. I just walked in, uh, unzipped the blind, sat down, and as I was getting my camera out, two cardinals flew in. That was the first time that I saw them here. I know I got them on the trail camera a couple times, but just like little things like that where, you know, the birds are kind of used to the noise and the sounds coming from this blind, so they're getting even more comfortable. And the more birds that are here, 
the more birds that'll also attract. I decided to move my camera up a little bit so I can start photographing some of these birds that are perching in the trees over here. If you've seen any perched birds this entire episode, whether in photos or videos, they've come from the exact same two branches that I stuck in the ground. It's amazing to see how big of an impact a bit of water can have on wildlife. I used to have a small tray of water in my yard and I was always surprised at how many birds would visit every day. Building a larger photography pond like this has definitely opened up new possibilities and it's so rewarding to see how many species are actually using it. It's only been a month since I built this pond and I'm so excited to see where it goes, how it progresses and what stories and species lie just around the corner. Before I go, I'd just like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creatives. Their classes cover a ton of topics ranging from photography, videography, editing, lifestyle, freelancing, and so much more. For those of you interested in photo editing, I recommend a class called Adobe Lightroom, Finding Your Unique Editing Style by Sean Dalton. I love how he breaks down the different popular editing styles, making it really easy to incorporate these techniques into your own editing workflow. Classes just like this are divided into easy to follow lessons with no ads, so you can really just focus on learning. All of their premium classes are available for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, so it's extremely affordable. And right now we're giving away free trials of Skillshare premium memberships to the first thousand of my subscribers that join using the link below. So check it out, there's a bunch of amazing learning opportunities, and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I'll see you in the next one. Happy birding.